First, sir, I'd like to thank you for agreeing to sit for an interview. My pleasure. And uh, you've actually sat in through a couple of these, so you know what's coming. But uh, what did you do before you entered the Army? What were you I doing? was a student at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I was a sophomore there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, hoping to go into the Army Air Corps. I had an older brother who was four years older than me, and he was already in and, uh, and a navigator on a B-25 bomber over there. And the Air Corps was the uh, glamour unit of the military back in those days. And since he was already there, I wanted to be in that. But I didn't get in, so I <clears throat> waited until Uncle Sam sent me a welcome letter in October 1942. And I was drafted, and I took a troop ship, I mean a, a train, and uh, left Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I woke up the next morning in, in Atlanta, and I said, oh, boy, we're going south for the winter anyway. And the next morning, I woke up, we were in Camp Campbell, Kentucky. <laughs> Went down there and back up. But anyway, that's a long way short. But that was my introduction to that, and I was uh, among those who started Camp Campbell, you know, it, we were the first unit that was at Camp Campbell. It was carved out of the red mud of Kentucky, and uh, we went through basic training there. Yeah. Now, tell me a little bit about the transition from being a college student to being a soldier. Well, it wasn't too bad. When I went in, they were interested in two things about me. One, I had two years of college, and the other one, I could type 60 words a minute. Probably saved my life. Uh, because I uh, wound up as a clerk in division headquarters, and uh, my brother, whom I mentioned to you earlier, unfortunately didn't make it back. He was shot down over Germany and uh, didn't make it back. I'll tell you more about that later. Mm -hmm. So you're one of the founding members of the 12th at Camp Campbell. Yes. Uh, any experiences from the training there or at Barclay uh, spring to mind? Well. It was tougher at at uh, at, uh, at in Kentucky because of the weather. You know, we were there in the winter time. You know, and there was snow, and we went on long hikes and all that sort of thing. But that was just to get us all toughened up. The weather was much better down in Texas when we uh, when we got down there. That was a major difference, uh, so far as I'm concerned, the two of them. But uh, uh, we got a real introduction to the army at. Uh, at Camp Campbell, Kentucky was in now Fort Campbell, of course. Now, after training, deploying overseas, uh, the, the the trip across the ocean. Tell me about it. Well, let me let me go back one thing here. Okay. We're talking about uh, our experiences on the state side. After we finished at Camp Campbell, Kentucky, we went on Tennessee maneuvers which was to really get us introduced to uh, what things might like be like overseas. Uh, about the time that the uh, division got ready to go on there, I was sent off to Army Administration School at uh, Mississippi Southern College in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So while my buddies were on Tennessee maneuvers, I was in a dormitory <laughs> down at Mississippi Southern College uh, studying Army Administration. and I. Uh, managed to make a superior on my grade on my studies down there, which got me a few promotions. And I spent really three and a half years as a T3 tech sergeant uh, in division headquarters, uh, AG section, and we handled writing all correspondence and orders and so forth, uh, promotions, awards, and so forth, uh, anything that had to do with that. Uh, one thing that happened to us while we were down in uh, Camp Barkley, Texas, so we wrote an order that nobody ever thought we'd ever see. We wrote an order demoting Major General Carlos Brewer, our commanding general, to the rank of colonel and transferring him out of 12th Armored Division. And we got a Major General Green who succeeded him very briefly but I never saw Major General Green. But then we went to Camp Shack, New York, and General Roderick R. Allen took over as commanding general, and he commanded us all through the, the uh, uh, hostilities. But I never thought I'd see a general, Major General, reduced in rank to the rank of colonel. And 
Uh, we heard lots of scuttlebutt about it. We had gone over to Camp Hood, Texas for an exercise, and uh, somebody said we flunked the exercise, and somebody says we left the Camp Barkley uh, uh, in a disreputable shape. We heard all kinds of s stories there. And the one that I choose to believe was that that 7th Army, uh, well, the Army, the Corps commander, excuse me, the Corps commander who was in charge over there at uh, Camp Hood, I understood it stemmed back to something that happened to him and Carlos Brewer when they were both at West Point. And he found a way to get even with him. Now, I have no way of knowing whether that was a true story or not, but we certainly did hear that. And we certainly couldn't believe that we had flunked the thing over at Camp Hood or that we had left the post in any disreputable state anyway. So anyway, that happened while we were there. Then we went to Camp Shanks, New York, and we got a couple of nights on the town before we board the ship. And we went over on the Empress of Australia, which was a huge, uh, at one time, a luxury liner. It was captured from the Germans during World War I by the British. They converted it into a luxury liner after the war. And then it was converted to a troop ship with carried boats. It had a tremendous number of, of personnel on it. And we were on board. We went down into the bowels of this thing, you know, and here was thing. I said, well, this is where we're going to leave all of our gear, you know. We don't know they left our gear. They left us down there. <laughs> the thing was loaded all the way down. And uh, the trip over was uneventful, but uh, but uh, the food wasn't good. It was British food, and uh, it wasn't particularly good. Some of those guys over there were on... Liberty ships uh, in the same convoy going over with us and talking to them later. They had much better food out there than we had on the Empress of Australia. So landing in England and getting ready to deploy to the continent, any uh, anything stand out? Well, I had uh, mentioned a moment ago that I lost my brother over there. We didn't know he had been killed at that time. We knew he was missing in action. And he had been with the 8th Air Force, first in all in North Africa and then in England. But when he was in the 8th Air Force, he was stationed near Norwich, uh, England, and he made friends with a British family there, a uh, man and his wife and a couple of daughters. And when he was not on mission, he would go over to their house, you know, and, uh, and uh, he left a dress uniform over there so he could change clothes and go out and so forth. And uh, I uh, made it a point to correspond with them before I went over, and I got a chance to go from London up to, uh, or Tidbrook, the barracks where we were up there, up to see them and paid a nice visit with them uh, and was glad I did because later I was going to be able to see them again after the war was over with. But uh, that was the one thing that stood out mostly for me in uh, in the time in London. Okay, then across the channel into France. Yeah, we, the, the crossing itself was uneventful. Our first night in, uh, in uh, France was at Affe, France, and uh, this was not too far inland. It was rainy and muddy and all this sort of thing, and since I was in division headquarters, <clears throat> I was in the same area where the general was, uh, General Allen. And he, some old French count had allowed him to take over his chateau as division headquarters. Of course, we were now out, buildings out back where all the rest of us were, but uh, the, we went in on the blackout conditions, and uh, we had these little slit lights in front of the headlights up there where they were only about a half inch high and about three inches across the headlights, just enough so that you could see the vehicle in front of you but nobody from the air above could see that there was a convoy moving along. But I say all this because it was night when we moved into this chateau, and even in November, he had a lawn out there at his chateau, you know, nice grass and all that sort of thing. And the old uh, count came down the next morning to pay his respects to the general, and uh, he, uh, as a parting shot, I understand, said to him, Glad to have you here, you know, and so forth. Uh, 
I noticed last night when you're coming in, though, some of the trucks got out on the edge of the grass. Appreciate it if you would try to keep the trucks off of the grass. So uh, General Allen said to uh, Colonel Ryan, his chief of staff, you know, take care of that, will you? So Colonel Ryan looked around. It was pretty easy to trace this truck that had gone out on the edge of the grass. It was right over there and parked right there. Well, it wasn't me, but it was our, it was a, AG section of division headquarters. Division eight Ashton General was Lieutenant Colonel Edwin M. Connell and uh, Colonel Ryan apparently didn't like Colonel Connell very well and that was just too good an opportunity for him to miss. So he called him in and kind of chewed him out <laughs> about that. And Colonel Connell comes out smarting and he is the first guy he sees in that's reporting to him, he says, Sergeant Torok you are on guard duty as of this moment. You walk up and down this road, which then was a quagmire about this deep, and you don't let any vehicle or anybody on that grass. Understood? Yes, sir. I'm the second guy that comes along. We had worn a little path along the edge of the grass there to keep out of the mud going back and forth to the mess, to the chow line down there. And... Uh, he says, hey, Whitey, that's what they call me, Whitefield. They called me Whitey back in those days. And uh, he said, off the grass. I said, off the grass? What do you mean? That, that you, you're, walking, you're muddy while you're walking over there. Colonel Connell says, Private Whitefield, when we say get off the grass, we mean get off the grass. <laughs> I got busted from T3 to uh, Private for walking on the grass in France during the war. I wrote that home to my uh, family. I had four sisters at home. They were all dating servicemen. I said to myself, those guys there dating servicemen, they're going to say, I don't know what your brother did over there, you know, but he ought to have been able to invent a better story than that. <laughs> uh, but that was the truth. But old Sergeant Henry Meese was a division sergeant major there. He was old regular army sergeant. He knew everything there was to know about the uh, army and uh, so forth. He just said, we, we published orders twice a month promoting or demoting officers. He said, you hang on, we'll get your stripes back in two weeks, which you did. So I was, stayed in the headquarters, didn't just kept on doing the same job, but I was a private for two weeks and then went back to my same rank there. But while I was at, at, uh, at Afe was also when we got the word that my brother had been killed when he was there. Only one in this plane that was killed, all the rest of them were prisoners of war. We never find out where, but I think his parachute must not have opened. But So, pressing on into the, uh, when the 12th first went into battle, you, of course, at the division, uh, yeah, but I was rear echelon, which yeah. is always a few miles behind the line, so I never really saw any fighting. Oh, we saw some planes come over in Bedchat Charlie, which was a German fighter plane, would come over and spray s s uh, bullets down our way every once in a while. And in fact, one of the boys in our uh, unit actually got killed on the back end of a truck when we were moving along one time when we were in a convoy. But that's the only casualty we had in the in the rear echelon group when we were there. Uh, but we just always moved up, but we were publishing orders all the time. Uh, when we got into combat, you mentioned Hurlesheim just now, which was one of awful, awful battle that we had there. We lost, lost a lot of men, but we start getting a stream of young listed men sent back to the rear to give them a direct commission, uh, the second lieutenant, for all the good works they had done up front. The first five of those that we got back were killed in action within days after they went back to the front. Now, where they were trying to show off that new second lieutenant bar that was shining for the enemy or what happened, but I know uh, we, we sure did feel for those guys because they came back and spent about a week with us back there, a little R&R, &R, and then cut the orders and made them a second lieutenant and sent them back up front. and. Uh, we just sort of felt like we'd lost a family member when they went back up there because we'd gotten to know them so personally. Uh, 
But those were the kind of situations that I remember. I also remember being on uh, CQ uh, the night that we got word that President Roosevelt had died. And that sort of shook up everybody back in those days. We, uh, we thought nobody could take his place. Now, uh, pressing on through the spring of 45, uh, operations like the Comar Pocket, do you uh, have any memories of that? Uh, not particularly. I, I really don't. Uh, as I said, we were just behind and and uh, so I, di I didn't really have any direct contact with that particular exercise. I know we, we got a lot of credit for going down there and cleaning out the Colmar pocket. The people down at Colmar certainly do remember us very fondly, but I didn't have any personal uh, record of that. Okay, and then of course being attached to the Third Army under General Patton for the push to the Rhine. It was a secret. We didn't know. We just we just sent them a battalion up there. We didn't. Yeah. Well, our whole division wasn't attached. Mm -hmm. It was just a tank battalion that was sent up there to help them out, and they called it the Mystery Division because we had to take off all the insignias off of the vehicles and everything, you know. And the Germans thought they had everybody accounted for that they were going to meet there, and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of tanks. Said, Where did they come from? You know. <laughs> So the 12th Armored Division really was uh, instrumental in uh, helping turn that battle back in our favor. Now, once we were across the Rhine into Germany, uh, did you get a chance to, to see or witness, or even at your post in the rear echelon, uh, the word about the liberation of the prisoner of war camps? The no, camps I did not. Uh, we moved very fast once we got across the Rhine. Uh, it was just moving almost every couple of days. We would move up another 50 kilometers or so to another location, and uh, and uh, we just kept doing that. And we'd go through one town, you know, Stuttgart, and all the rubble. There. Every town you went through was was uh, severely damaged by all the bombing that our uh, uh, air force had had our corps had done, and the shelling that the guys in the field artillery had done. They did a tremendous damage there. We got down to Ulm, and I was very pleased to see that across the road from the railroad station there in the center of Ulm was a cathedral that was apparently un basically untouched. They had done such a good job of pinpointing their bombing that they, uh, they left back right there. And we went on down to, uh, on down to uh, pass Ulm, uh, frankly, just went on down to where we ran out of anybody to fight and uh, turned around and came back and sat for a couple of days before they announced officially that the war was over with. But, but we knew it was over with for a European theater was concerned. Now, once the war was over, how did your duties change and how long were you still in, in uh, Europe? Well... Having lost my stripes back in November, I mentioned there, and got them back, just as the war was over with, there were a lot of people that were coming home, and uh, they had to fill some slots uh, for people who were already coming home. And uh, I got an appointment as a warrant officer, and I was personnel officer of the 493rd Armored Field Artillery Battalion in the 12th for about six weeks until I got a commission in the Adjutant General Corps and went right back to the headquarters where I had been an enlisted man. <laughs> and uh, soon after that, though, we were transferred. All the rest that weren't coming home uh, with the 12th, we were transferred to the 1st Armored Division and went to Swabish Gmund, uh, Germany. And I stayed there until the fall of spring when I came home. But... Uh, uh, after having been an enlisted man for three and a half years, uh, all of a sudden I went from sergeant to warrant officer to second lieutenant to first lieutenant in about six months. <laughs> and I came home as a first lieutenant and stayed in the Army Reserves for 20 years and retired as a major. Came home and went back to school at the university in Chapel Hill where I graduated. Well, One other thing I'd like to mention, though, I mentioned that I had uh, visited this family in uh, in uh, England that was friends of my uh, uh, brother, and I got 
permission to go over there, had to leave and went over there. I was still a sergeant, but he had left some uniforms over there, and uh, and I brought them back with me. And when I got appointed a warrant officer, I took all the insignia off of his his and put mine on it, and I had dressed uniforms. Everybody else had got a commission or anything of that kind had all these ODs, you know. They didn't have any dress uniforms. Where did you get these dress uniforms? There was pinks and greens, we called them back in those days. And I said, well, sadly, they belong to my brother. Uh, but I did have a nice visit with the, the family over there. And uh, I was very grateful to them for the hospitality which they showed me uh, uh, in Norwich when I was over there. And I got permission from the Army en route to the uh, port of debarkation over there to come back home. Instead of taking a troop train across with everybody else, I got a driver and uh, another lieutenant, uh, and we drove to Bitburg, Germany, where my brother was buried. And I found a little cemetery and found his grave and I uh, uh, reported back, took some pictures, which I still have of me standing in front of the grave over in the corner where the black crosses were because we were enemy soldiers that were buried in that uh, civilian cemetery. And I talked to the undertaker there to try to find out what happened to him, but he didn't remember one of those from another at that time, you know. So anyway, wound up bringing him back home. He's buried in Durham, which was my hometown. Well, sir, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit and talk with me. Let me correct one other thing of okay. history. Go ahead. History. When I was a young second lieutenant, I was duty officer one Sunday. Beautiful Sunday. The war is over with. Everybody's relaxing and so forth. General Allen decided to take his driver and uh, go out somewhere for a drive. At the same time, General Patton decided to take his driver and go out in the countryside for a drive. My phone rang out in the middle of the afternoon there, and I never talked to so many generals in my life before or after as I did that afternoon. I thought the war had started again. It turned it out that General Patton had been in an automobile accident with a two-and-a-half-ton truck from our division. And... Uh, it was not like the movie showed him in, in an accident with an ox cart or something of that kind. But anyway, General Patton sent word down to our unit not to do anything to the driver of a truck because he said it was not his fault. He said, I told my driver to turn around in the middle of the road thinking there was no traffic there and it was on a curve and this truck came around and broadsided the general's car. He, uh, he, he was not killed instantly. He lived for about a week or ten days, and his wife even came over from the United States to see General Patton before he died. And I think he probably died happy. I mean, the war is all behind me now. What else is left for me? <laughs> but I think it's interesting that, that uh, I had that experience uh, that day. We had a hard time tracking down General Allen to say that people want to talk to you, but we found him. I thank you for letting me talk to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.